It's a pleasure then to invite Ian to speak on uh, West of Eden, Common Space and Utopia in the very earlier counterculture. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for for coming. Um, so, I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, a project which now, for not originally, but now is uh, goes under the title of uh, West of Eden. Um, it's congealed into a, a book that's coming out from. Um, PM Press in the, in in Oakland uh, later in the year. So those of you who are interested to follow up some of this stuff, um, invite you to look out for West of Eden <coughs> PM Press. Uh, it's a collective project. I'm really just going to be ventriloquizing a lot of the research that uh, has been done over um, many years. Uh, it was conceived in the in about 2003-04 um, and was organized by four, four of us, uh, two, uh, two historians, um, a geographer uh, and an anthropologist, but all of whom have had in various ways extensive uh, experience um, and commitment to commoning and the communal life of one sort and another. Uh, it was first called the Communes Project um, and was funded by, uh, a, a, it, was a collab it is a collaboration between um, the Institute of International Studies at Berkeley um, and the Mendocino Institute um, in, in Fort Bragg. And it's, it's a Northern California project and you can see from the the map here. Um, how many people here have, have been to Northern California and can visualize it? So, so you know, okay, quite a few. Um, I'll be talking uh, somewhat about um, a, um, a series of communes um, along the Albion River. Um, Albion Ridge goes from the Pacific Littoral inland uh, a few miles towards the coastal range um, and it's just south of Fort Bragg you can see Fort Bragg up there um, just north of Mendocino Fort Bragg is the home of the last great lumber company um, in in Northern California it's closed the mill closed a few years ago and marks the end of the quietus of a very long project of the deforestation of the continent. Um, the last stands of redwood um, had been fought over um, and that fight has been led often by the children of communards rusticating in the explosion of commoning and communalism that I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Um, and there's a lot of interesting stories one could tell um, about the the contradictions and the struggles um, around Fort Bragg between those um, back to the land hippies um, and the people that they first began to think of as um, stupid redneck lumbermen. Um, and it was a, a vicious and in many ways a vicious struggle. I mean, people died uh, in that fight. Um, the car bomb in Oakland not many years ago, uh, Judy Barry, very badly injured. Um, so it's a very interesting struggle over the, the environment, and, and I'm going to be talking a bit about the, the geography, the, the, the social and political geography uh, of this uh, Edenic landscape. <coughs> um, so we started with the, the fact of this extraordinary efflorescence of communalism um, that is still yet to be fully explained that began, we could say, in the mid-60s, roughly, um, 
uh, and had a kind of a trajectory. And again, I'll talk again a bit about the, the periodization here. It's not really... Decadalism is a problem for the historians. History doesn't work in decades exactly. Um, sometimes it does more or less, or even centuries, right? The long, the long 18th, the short 20th. Um, for some reason, in the mid-60s, thousands of young people got on Greyhound buses from the East Coast and headed west, not really knowing where they were going. They were heading for San Francisco. Um, and they weren't especially political. I mean, the, the resistance to the Vietnam War was growing, but um, they came uh, for reasons that were not very focused, and um, they often found themselves in, in San Francisco for a while and then scattered out into the hinterland. And many of the people that in this project we, we spoke to who settled there have very interesting personal trajectories. Um, and I'll be mentioning one or two specifically. Now, of course, there's a very long and rich tradition of communitarian living in the New World and in California um, in, in particular. Um, this is another map of California. <clears throat> Some of you recognize it. Of course, it's the frontispiece from Thomas More's Utopia. As you know, uh, the first half of Utopia is, is a description of the nightmare that he encountered that triggered the, the writing of More's Utopia. What he was witnessing, of course, was the, the initial enclosures uh, in, in the English countryside. Yeah. The replacement of people by sheep. Um, the, the artist who was engaged to imagine um, Utopia, as described in Thomas More's book, is the first, of course, in a long tradition in which utopia, or, or a kind of a secular, in this case not secular, it was a kind of religious, uh, Eden is imagined to be some, somewhere west. And um, one could say that one could, one could give a talk on the history of California itself uh, as more an idea than a place, and of course uh, a utopian idea as well. We shall be picking up on that. There was no, um, as they say, singular point um, of origin for this extraordinary sort of mid, just after the mid 20th century explosion of utopian projecting. Um, but for reasons that I'm going to try to persuade you of, uh, and um, it's still arguable. The Bay Area was a very generative node, and quite a lot of the contours of late modernity um, have their origins in what happened there in the counterculture. But of course, I'm, I want to register immediately that um, this is only one node. I mean, after all, uh, what happened in '68 was a truly global phenomenon. Um, the method that we used was um, rather standard uh, ethnographic fieldwork of a sort. Um, our informants often were having to depend on flashbacks. Um, um, usefully supplemented by freedom of information documents based on unobtrusive FBI note-takers at um, a whole lot of things that were happening in the Bay Area at that time. And then a series of workshops and conferences and meetings, both in the city of San Francisco and across the Bay and Berkeley, and then up in the hinterland, at which we brought together uh, ex and post communards to discuss their memories. Um, and we looked for various reasons, in particular, as I say, at this place just south of Fort Bragg, um, 
near the town of Mendocino, the Albion Ridge, which was, for various interesting reasons, the site of a whole of a series of of rather heterogeneous communes of various kinds, ranging from um, one run by a very charismatic Earth Mother to uh, a Marxist-Leninist enclave to um, um, lesbian separatist, you name it. There's a there's a um, a lot of interesting things uh, happening there over a period of about uh, ten or fifteen years. Uh, however, <clears throat> what we found was in our first cut, we were interested in the differences between the city and the country, as it were. That was our first sort of analytic cut. We're talking really about urban versus rural communes. One can talk about there's the, there's the urbanites and then there's the back to the landers. In the mythos of the counterculture, that is a really important dichotomy. And what we found in our work was that it didn't really survive examination. Um, of course, there are very important differences between urban and rural sites. But it's not the case, for example, that on the one hand you had the young politicos resisting the Vietnam War staying to fight alongside with their brothers and sisters in Oakland, the Black Panthers, for example, um, and those utopians turning their back on the horrors of the American Empire and um, the invasion of Vietnam and just going to reinvent themselves and make a new life uh, in, in the hinterland. There were many transactions between the city and the country. And in particular, um, I would say that uh, there were many communes in the countryside in which there was, for example, a weekly run in a BW bus to the city with, for example, the first commodified soy burgers made on at Lyme Settle, which was a a commune in the uh, Sierra foothills. Um, soy became the kind of sacramental food of the counterculture um, for interesting reasons. There was a rejection of the kind of the Cold War cuisine of the, say, Connecticut suburbs, where if somebody comes for dinner and there aren't enough pieces of meat in the freezer, they have to go away again. The nice thing about beans and soy is that they're equally divisible. It can be eaten with one large, long spoon. Right. So the foodways are very important, and uh, we'll come back to that. But what's, what was interesting to us, that we needed analytically to certainly acknowledge a difference, although not a dichotomy, between the city and the country, we needed to acknowledge a kind of a third space. That's to say that two of the most important settlements in the Bay Area counterculture were situated about 45 minutes uh, away from the central locus, uh, the two central loci of the counterculture, which in the East Bay was at the junction of Telegraph Avenue and Bancroft Avenue um, at the southern edge of the University of California. Um, and in the West Bay, in San Francisco, uh, it was the um, Victorian neighborhood uh, uh, of what's called Haight-Ashbury, where Grand Zero is the intersection of Haight and Ashbury Street. This was a Victorian uh, community that had, during the 50s, had been largely vacated by the successful uh, Irish immigrants who moved further out to the suburbs. And by the mid-60s, there was plenty of room for refunctioned, so, um, refunctioned spaces for what became the uh, very vibrant center of the counterculture in San Francisco. Um, Just to finish for a moment on the, say a little bit more about the environmental imaginary of 
in the United States compared to, say, the British Isles. Even though, as I, I, I insist that the rural urban dichotomy needs to be troubled and, and dismantled in some way. Nevertheless, at the level of ideology, it's very strong. In fact, it's, 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 it's extremely strong. One could say that you, you know, there's a lot that can be explained by understanding the environmental imaginary in, in, um, in white America um, as indeed dichotomous between the city and the wilderness. This goes back to old Puritan narratives and the city on the hill, and so on. And for that reason, um, the word countryside doesn't really exist in, Brit in American English. Nobody gets into a car and goes for a drive in the countryside. No. If you live in the Bay Area and you're going out to... You're going away for the weekend to uh, restore yourself. Um, you pass quickly through the space of agriculture, the Central Valley, which is huge. The Central Valley stretches um, from Northern California all the way down to LA, about 400 miles. Maybe about one fifth of all the vegetables on earth are grown there. It's a massive space of uh, agriculture. And yet nobody lingers there, and it doesn't. It, it, it's, a, it's a kind of lost space in a way. Um, where people are headed is the wilderness, even though there's, even though it was, it is crowded with other people on the weekend. If you go to Yosemite, you know that. And even though Yosemite was not a wilderness, it was a garden. It was the home of the Miwok people before the virtual genocide. <clears throat> virtual only in the sense that it didn't co completely happen and the Miwok do survive. It's not that it was complete. So, compare that to here. In the British Isles, one of the reasons that the, the agricultural Luddism in the late 90s, beginning in the late 90s here, in response to the transfection of, um, of uh, plant DNA into maize and other crops. One reason why the agricultural levism was so successful, the, the, the um, anti-GM movement, uh, was because of the very strong sense that people have of a countryside um, and a space of agriculture that is somehow that was somehow being polluted. It's not it's not the case in, in California, but not in the United States. As I say, it's a kind of a lost space. Here the environmental imaginary is ideologically the dominant one, is of a deeply settled, humanized landscape. There's not this sort of wilderness versus city thing going on. It ha it's important later when we talk about what happened at some of these communes. Um, the deep history of utopian communities, um, we found owed a very large debt, we all in a very large, owe a very large debt to the long-term sociological labors of um, a very fine um, historical sociologist called Timothy Miller. And if you're interested in the history of utopian communities in the New World, you better get hold of Timothy Miller's books. Uh, they're an essential resource um, in, in the subject. Of course, a, a, a proper historical account of commoning in the New World, of course, would have to begin with those who were there originally, which were commoning cultures. One would begin with the um, American Indian communities. And, of course, then the, the encounter between the indigenous peoples um, and the Western Anglos. There's a lot of poignancy in the fact that Many communards, um, in order to 
come up with their own rituals went into red drag, as it were, playing playing the native, and there's a lot of interesting discussion you can have about that. The white American radicals and dreamers um, set up all kinds of fascinating communities in the 19th century. I'm going to include the 19th century now. Right? These often would be on greenfield sites, as it were, do I say now. Very much uh, different from uh, what was happening in the 60s and 70s in the Bay Area, where there were virtually no uh, new builds by utopians, for reasons that we could discuss. I once asked Dolores Hayden, the great historian, architectural historian of utopias in the new world, I said, Dolores, can you think of a single utopian commune um, and show me the blueprints and, you know, um, and a building between, say, 1967 and 1973 in Northern California, and she could not. So what we're talking mainly is refunctioned, you know, warehouses, Victorians, and in the countryside they'd, they'd be uh, farmhouses and so on. I'll come to the question of the utopian forms um, uh, later. There was one, of course, that, and there were many of them. Um, the geodesic dome, and I'll come to that. The socialists of the 19th century in the Bay Area, and there were many, um, of course, setting themselves up against uh, rapacious uh, individualists. Um, they had a grand time um, trying to set themselves up in business. Um, this is one of the most interesting, the Kauai colony. Has anyone been out to the... Um, um, Sequoia National Park in California, by any chance? Yeah, okay. Right. The post office is all that survives of the... It, one could spend an hour talking about the Kauaians. They were led by a very energetic and um, slightly crackpot lawyer. Only a little more, less crackpot than his followers who not, followers is wrong. It, was, it wasn't a kind of a guru situation, but he was a charismatic instigator of the Kauai colony. And um, um, he tore his hair out having to deal with um, crazed spelling reformers and antinomians of all kinds. And uh, it's kind of an interesting situation. What, what happened was that, that um, they did set themselves up in business. They went logging. That was how they were going to make a living uh, in the Sierra. Um, and they managed to... Um, what happened here? How is that not working? Yeah. They arranged to buy a series of contiguous lots in the, in the Sierras. So that with the, the process that began um, in the English countryside, the, encl the enclosures described by, by, um, by Moore in Utopia, uh, in a sense, uh, um, and for which, of course, Ireland itself was a laboratory, if you read Francis Bacon's manifesto on plantations, you'll get a sense. Uh, the Westering project began with Ireland as a laboratory, and then the New World was taken in. And so what happened was that you got the gridding of the New World. If you fly over North America in a plane, you can see that this is essentially what happened. So you get a kind of a, there's a cadastral survey, there's a gridding. The Westering Anglos punch their way over the Appalachian crest for the enclosure of North America, and you get this kind of a system, which is then simply commodified and put up for sale. And the Kauaians just uh, went to the to the office and and applied next to each other, and so they did. They kind of socialized the project in a way that sort of shocked the authorities when they discovered, my gosh, there's a whole nest of socialists here right next to each other. And the reason that the Sequoia Park is a national park is because that's how they got rid of them eventually. Um, the Kauaian colonists um, would have. Would have, would have uh, perhaps collapsed ultimately, as most of these utopian experiments do. 
Um, but um, but not before the, the the U.S. cavalry was sent in to get them out of what had been declared a national park at about 2 a.m. in the morning in 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 Congress. Um, the largest tree, the largest redwood there in Sequoia, um, the General Sherman tree, was not the General Sherman tree originally. That was renamed General Sherman, but it was the Karl Marx tree. Um, not um, well known to standard visitors. Uh, this, some of you who've read the great uh, founding text of modern critical urbanism, City of Quartz, Mike Davis' City of Quartz, you'll recognize that he reproduces this in, as, in the, as a kind of frontispiece picture. This is the remains, the, the sad remains of the Llano del Rio commune in Antelope Valley in Southern California. Uh, this is the story of uh, uh, an amazing commune, the single uh, largest of all California communes. There were 1,100 people there at one point. Um, eventually, they were done in through water politics. It's a story of um, water, as many of much of California history is, and they were they uh, they were all done by the 1920s when they moved east. Um, any of these any of these communes deserve uh, a much um, longer account. When the, uh, the counterculturalists um, assembled in uh, around Haight Ashbury, uh, some of them were quite literate. They had um, been to college in post war America, and uh, some of them started to read uh, the book by the Master of Balliol, Christopher Hill, uh, The World Turned Upside Down, in which he resuscitated all the crazed sectarians and, um, and antinomians in the revolutionary decade of the 17th century um, that was spun out of the vortex of the English Revolution. Um, among them, the diggers. And so the, the diggers were uh, revived in San Francisco uh, in in the mid sixties, um, what's remarkable is that um, the stories, uh, the, the the history of this remarkable uh, communal uh, burst of colony, um, has been so. Uh, there's such a dearth of, of new work on it. You couldn't really understand that, and I think it needs explanation in itself. Mostly, uh, I don't know if it's still true, but certainly when we started, we were greeted with kind of weary condescension. Um, the word commune itself is kind of terribly out of fashion. Even though there are as many uh, communes as there ever were, if you do the counting, if you look at their own if you look at their own magazines and things. No one now calls themselves a commune, pretty much. Partly because there's the general anathematizing of the 60s. Um, but what we discovered um, was that for tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of Americans in the 60s and 70s, there was, um, in some form or another, an experiencing of a life in common, one that consciously rejected dominant modes of consumption and representation, even though it was later disavowed. And one of the things we found was that bringing these people together uh, released a, a tremendous flood of memories. Um, many became, you know, deeply affected. It was uh, very emotional often, um, partly because people recognized how much they had repressed and, and disavowed. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that all the 
current anti-systemic politics and the organizing style that one associates, shall we say, with Seattle, um, the Battle of Seattle, the World Social Forum, um, a full two, maybe one or two, even three generations later, had their roots in these collective practices of the 60s. Um, and as I say, even though it's disavowed, you can look around contemporary American life, and to some extent over here too, and you see um, the kind of aftermath in contemporary practices. I've mentioned uh, food ways. I think that's important. Uh, the protocols of group meetings and decision making um, in sexual politics and child rearing, um, in the practices of civic life and local politics. Certainly, that's true in in, um, in the Bay Area. Uh, in a very widespread green sensibility, um, and in a general valorization of community. One says that with a certain irony, because of course. Community is the kind of central shibboleth in American culture. There's nobody who's um, right across the political spectrum who declares themselves against community. Maybe maybe one, um, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. He was the only man in America. And he has a lot of time to ponder that resistance in uh, solitary confinement. Just a word about periodization. Um, we had to ask ourselves how we were to judge these extraordinary plethora of experiments in living and working and other things, uh, given that most of them, quote, failed. And I want to come back to this question of success and failure. What counts as success? What counts as failure? Is longevity a real measure? Was it a failure? Certainly one, we can say that the, that the counter-revolution to the revolutionary impulse behind this uh, efflorescence, uh, one could say, in our minds, um, I'm speaking now about the, the editors of Western Eden, in our minds the, the key date is September the 11th, <clears throat> 1973, with the fixed-wing aircraft attack on Allende's palace in Santiago, Chile, and the sending down of the Chicago boys, the, the first uh, experiment in neoliberal economics, which Margaret Thatcher so enjoyed and found an inspiration in. So that for us was the beginning of the, as it were, the neoliberal backlash, which we are now still living through. Just a word about communalism and the whole lexical cluster, because there's a there's a whole series of words that are interanimating and sometimes etymologically cognate. Commune, communal, communard, community, communication, commons, commoning. All of them highly charged terms and much contested. Um, consider the, the Ur Commune, the Paris Commune for 1871, which lasted only 73 days, and was instantly the object of bourgeois hatred and scorn, understandably. On March the 18th, the French government, which had fled to Versailles, sent in troops who then refused to fire on the jeering crowd. Instead, they turned their weapons on the officers, shooting their commander. The commune had begun. Factories became co-ops. Education was declared free and universal. Priests and nuns were evicted from schools. Day nurseries were opened next to places of work. George Sand wrote to Flaubert, Your commune's chosen leaders, administrators, inspirers, are they all brigands and cretins? It's an orgy of self-styled renovators who possess not an idea, not a principle. And Flaubert, no more your average bourgeois, by the way, than George Sand, wrote to her, to George Sand, I hate democracy, always formulas, always gods. The only reasonable thing is a government of mandarins. The people is an eternal infant. Hmm, this is strong stuff, right? Flaubert need not have worried, 
The Commune was crushed by a bloody massacre of 30,000 citizens of Paris. It was a slaughter which, if you were to believe the wall text in the interesting Utopia exhibit at the New York Public Library some years ago, the Communards brought on themselves. The take-home message to the visitor to this exhibit um, at the Library of New York uh, was very loud and clear. Uh, thinking of realizing Utopia? Forget it. They'll always end in a bloodbath. You know, the Kronstadt Soviet, the Spanish Republic, Jonestown, Family Manson, Elder Skelter. Now, the curators of the New York Public Library exhibit are not, by any means, of course, the only defamers of utopia. For utterly different reasons, Karl Marx himself snorted, I do not write cookbooks for the kitchens of the future. In the US, anti-utopianism is linked to fear and contempt of anything that smacks of commoning of communism. Orwell's version of it was hardly separable from anti-communism which no doubt accounts for his popularity in Cold War America. But of course, a deeper history of the suppressed memory is, is what we're talking about here, it seems to me. And I've mentioned this. That is to say, anti-communism is really, I think, what is really suppressing um, is, a, is this domestic memory of a continent of indigenous commoning cultures of native not just that, but that's an important part of it. Um, a word on, on the literature. We, we, we never did. We wanted to try to ask and find out what, what, were, the, what were on the bookshelves um, in 1964, 5, 6, 7, um, in, in those early experiments in California. I mean, we know some of the answer to that. The relationship of utopian literature to the social experiments of the 60s is a fascinating and unstudied topic. Utopias are notoriously liable to a negative reading, even in the home of positivity. The young Philip Dick lit out for dystopian territory, perhaps because as a Cold War teenager growing up in Berkeley in the 1940s, he registered the fact that on the Edenic hillside campus from which he soon dropped out, the weapons of apocalypse were being imagined and designed. I was telling Mark earlier that um, not just uh, Robert Oppenheimer, but Edward Teller um, lived on the road behind me in, um, on Hawthorne Terrace. Another wartime denizen of Berkeley, Ursula Le Guin, who lived, who was the child of um, the anthropologist uh, Crowley, um, four doors up from my own house on Arch Street. Ursula Le Guin, daughter of the Kroeber household, navigated the genre uh, with brilliant ambiguity um, in The Dispossessed. Her anarchist utopia joins news from nowhere and Bolo Bolo as beacons in a pretty dismal, dismal dreamscape. The historian of urban utopias, Mike Davis, once said that Ernest Kallenbach's uh, Ecotopia, set and written in Berkeley, was the scariest book he'd ever read. A green, read white utopia with Oakland and its ferment of black power nowhere on the map. To present day cooperators drawn to the communal life, the word commune, as I said, is sufficiently embarrassing that more or less nobody uses it. They prefer the anodyne term intentional community. Community as I've also said, offends nobody except Ted Kaczynski. A journalist on National Public Radio once introduced a soundbite from a spokesman from the organized crime community. <laughs> Another recurrent issue, one that haunts the pages of West of Eden, can be expressed um, thus, and this is where I get to the, the success-failure because obviously one could say it's a declensionist narrative. I mean, this is, um, maybe this is a basic narrative of Western literature. It's a fall out of Eden, precisely. Uh, how one tells an environmental story that isn't a declensionist narrative is an interesting question. 
Richard uh, White, the great historian of the Columbia River, a magnificent book um, on the history of the Columbia River, the organic machine, I think it's called, um, was very upset that he'd fallen into a declensionist account and he wanted to become a kind of more postmodernist. But, I mean, I think this is ludicrous. Uh, on, any, on any account, um, that is a story uh, of dissolution and decline. Uh, not least of the salmon, for heaven's sake. So was co commune X or cooperative Y a success? Or alternatively, a failure? It's striking, we found, <clears throat> how little one can gauge the true significance of some communal endeavour, either for the participants or for the wider society, by knowing only its lifespan. The sharing of a house in common that might have lasted but one summer often has effects, or had effects, that continue to resonate 40 years on in the lived experience of those involved, far beyond its brief moment. Um, on Albion Ridge, for example, um, that cluster of communes I was telling you about, in the first collective meeting we had of communards who, 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 who had been living on, on the ridge, and many of them still were, they came together, and I, we were in a schoolhouse that had been built by the communards from these, from these different settlements coming together to build a schoolhouse. Because if these things had a life, then there were children. We sat in the schoolhouse um, in a room about um, a little smaller than this, around in a circle of about 15 people. A very fascinating series of, of, of narratives came out. Began, we began to get a kind of a sense of the trajectory of their stories. Um, we'd spent a couple of days and we had a last session. And uh, I was there with one of the other editors and I was moderating the discussion. At the end I said something like, so really we're talking about failure here in a way. And before I said anything else, um, a woman whose name was Luna said to me, how dare you? How dare you say that? It was a failure. You pointy-headed academics came up from Berkeley and shit on us. Mm -hmm. I, would not, I would not give up one day of my years on the commune. That's outrageous. Well, of course, I was about to apologize. But before I could apologize, over here, interrupted Red Wing, for that was her name. And Red Wing said to Luna, not to me, said to Luna, Luna, I've known you since 1968. How dare you? How dare you deny that it was a failure? I know what your dreams were. They were the same as mine. That is outrageous. <laughs> right? So we knew we had a project at that point. In other words, it's an unmastered history here. And of course, probably both things are true. One of the fascinating things that the, these, is the relation to outside capital. Can you be outside capital in these kinds of enclaves? It's a good question. The aftermath is very poignant sometimes. There was one woman who was still living on the land, had married a, a well-known architect, had a beautiful architect built house on the communal land. The other one had had no resources, was working as a midwife in her mid-late 60s, had breast cancer, and um, was living in the detritus of her dreams of a better world. Right? Another example just about the question of failure, success, what did it mean, what, what, how should we take it? In one of the um, workshops or in one of the conferences back down in Berkeley, we brought together a lot of the urban communards including many who'd been involved in the Berkeley Co-op, which began up near Fort Bragg and Mendocino, the Finns, or the Finn, uh, Finn community, which was split between the, um, the white Finns and the red Finns, depending on whether you were a social democrat or kind of a communist. And they spun off, and some of them started the Berkeley Co-op in the 1920s and 30s. Um, the Berkeley Co-op 
collapsed in the late 90s. Um, and the standard narrative is that it was a case of corporate ripoff, that, uh, that big grocery had come in and uh, ripped off the ideas of, you know, bins of stuff and delis and, and um, unit pricing. Unit pricing, which is now the, the basic prerogative of any shopper in the Western world, so you know what it is you're getting for what value. Unit pricing began in the Berkeley Co-op. It's a rational thing to do. It's a Finnish thing to do. Was the now universal practice of unit pricing of groceries simply appropriated by the capitalist food system? Was it an appropriation? Should we be angry about that? Was the question in the room. Or does it rather represent a quiet triumph for those canny Finnish cooperators who founded the co-op in the interbellum years and invented this obviously rational thing? Is it not truly a victory, one might say, for utopians, when unit pricing, like the weekend or contraception, is no longer tagged as radical, but belongs to all and is generalized across the globe? Interesting question. Okay, so we can ask. The Berkeley Co-op is gone and many more in its passing. But many of the things that happened there have indeed been generalized and taken up within capitalist consumer culture, but not just a failure, right? I want to move now to a question of questions of race and class. Um, Timothy Miller's accounts of utopian communities in the New World is basically a white story. Um, dimensions of race and class are typically occluded in discussions of communalism, partly because communes, as of the ones I'm discussing in the mid 20th century, but certainly also for the 19th, um, and especially the rural communes, were over overwhelmingly white and middle class. A word about one of the most important communes in the Bay Area in the 1960s. The occupation by local Native American tribes joined by others of Alcatraz, the island in the middle of the Bay, um, is interesting because it was a commune. Beginning on the 20th of November 1969, a group of Native Americans uh, from a number of different tribes occupied the island of Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay and proposed an education center, an ecology center, and a cultural center. During the occupation, which ended in June 1971, the Indian termination policy designed to end federal recognition of tribes was rescinded. This is one of the victories of the commune on Alcatraz, the, the Indian termination policy was rescinded by President Nixon and the new policy of self-determination established, in part as a result of the publicity and awareness created by the occupiers. I could say a lot more about the occupation of Alcatraz and the, um, the sad sequelae, in a way, within, the, um, within Red America, um, but that can wait. Um, Berkeley is contiguous with Oakland, which is the birthplace of the Black Panther Party, which is troped as always as a kind of a militant organization, which it was. Uh, what is overlooked uh, is that there was a, a very large and vibrant uh, communalist ethos, communal housing, uh, or very extensive communal housing. Um, they're known for their breakfast programs. And that was an interesting thing, the, 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 the kind of social welfare aspect of the Panthers has its parallels, of course, in, for example, in the Islamic world, the, 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 uh, the failure of the developmentalist state opened up space for this kind of thing um, in, um, 
in lots of different places. Robin Spencer, who's a social historian of um, post-World War II protest movements and is a um, professor in, in New York, uh, she digs deeply into the history of the Black Panthers to reveal the party and its activities from below, looking past uh, the guns and the posturing, um, in particular um, at efforts at not just collective housing, but the creation of autonomous spaces and institutions. And again, not just free breakfast programs, but free clinics, independent newspaper, and many other projects. Um, the Black Panthers, um, because they thought that um, the revolution was coming on, went out to a remote uh, commune far in the north of California, Black, the, the uh, Black Bear Ranch, um, to do rifle practice. And that was the remotest of the, of the communes. And the history of Black Bear itself is very interesting. And one of the, young, uh, one of the youngsters who arrived at Black Bear in the, in the mid-60s has a very interesting memoir in the book. Um, I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, as to class, the issue of livelihood, money, resources, um, and the need for sharing of goods and property, if you didn't have a lot of it yourself, was certainly part of the impetus for the Panthers' um, explicit communalism. Um, and it was certainly never far from the minds of many of the rusticating communards who, who could not afford even what was then much um, in, in uh, relative terms, and of course certainly in absolute terms, um, much less money needed for down payment on a, you know, on, on a property out in the countryside. Um, Not a few communes, it turned out, when we did the ethnography, founded precisely because of the relation to outside capital, in the sense that some members of the beloved community, even if they pooled their resources, when it came, for example, to the care of children, could call on outside capital, something as simple as presence at Christmas. The demands of the cash nexus, the regime of private property, ground rent, etc., and the reign of the commodity constituted a force field that soon enough produced the elephant on the Northern California commune. And here I'm talking about um, green gold, marijuana, and its associated political economy. Uh, the Humboldt County, um, Mendocino County, um, their economies are um, massive, massively dominated by marijuana <clears throat> and, uh, and, uh, and wine. Um, the grape plantations are in, in a rather standard sort of latifundiary mode of production, drawing on um, brown, let's just say Mexican, Central American stoop labor. The marijuana economy, interestingly, it could, it could be if it were not illegal, it, it could be latifundiary in that sense. It could be on an agribusiness scale, but at the moment it's kind of petty production. And particularly given the medical marijuana laws, you can make a pretty damn good living just with, you're allowed maybe some, in some, in some counties it's you know, I think 10 plants, sometimes 20 plants. And even at current prices, you can get about $2,000 a plant. Uh, that's not on the street. That's at the first. That's that's to the first dealer. So you can make a you can make a, a legal living um, and survive in rural California. There's tremendous deep poverty in rural California hinterland, but you can make a living if you're making if you're working in the green gold industry. Um, big business is is uh, waiting to move in. Big tobacco, uh, the Mexican cartels, they're, they're very interesting. Now, whether it will be made legal, that's a, a current struggle. The, the, the crisis of 
The California economy suggests that it may be because the, the state is interested in taxing it, which of course it doesn't at the moment. Um, from the point of view of the communards, what's interesting is that once the, the marijuana was no longer imported from the south, and it's one of the triumphs of, of California agriculture, the, um, the, the intensification um, of the plant vis a vis um, efficacy. Um, it's interesting. So the communes that say were um, operating as small homesteads with you know pigs and orchards, um, they mostly that's all sort of they've stopped. Um, they've gone over to to marijuana to those that survive. Um, okay. So I want now. Um, I have a little bit more to go, but not much. If we ask ourselves then this question, you know, what were the conditions of possibility that sent tens of thousands of people into commoning practices, sharing things, um, turning away from the, the American dream, pumped out by madmen, bad men, sorry. <coughs> What were the conditions of possibility of the events of the 60s in the San Francisco Bay Area? Well, the prehistory was the 50s, the, the kind of the much maligned 50s. There were intense struggles in the 1950s in San Francisco to abolish censorship, to speak freely, and to perform without license. Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti at City Lights, that was a very important struggle. The obscenity trial over Hull. Um, the broadcasting of bohemian antinomian values um, on Pacifica Radio. Pacifica Radio was an FM station based in Berkeley. They had wanted an AM station, they being the founders of Pacifica Radio just after the Second World War. It's a small group of poets and syndicalists, anarcho-syndicalists, who had been conscientious objectors and were, were very depressed that the small gestetnerd and roneoed pamphlets agitating against the war, uh, an imperialist war as they saw it, an inter-imperialist war, had failed and they wanted mass effects, to use a kind of Dwight McDonald formulation, they wanted mass effects, let's use mass media, they wanted the radio. They were not allowed an AM station, which um, was um, their first aim, that they could project it at the old Shipyards of Richmond, where there were large uh, black and white proletarian communities, the people who had built the Liberty ships um, to defeat Japan and Germany. Um, no, they were given an FM station, um, which the state, I'm talking about the federal state, uh, thought was kind of unimportant, partly because there was almost nobody could listen to it. Nobody had FM. Frequency modulation had been invented in the mid-30s by Armstrong, who threw himself out of a high window in New York because he couldn't get it going, because it was RCA and others were frightened that it would cut into their, their TV um, plans. But nevertheless, um, soon enough, people started getting radio receivers. And Pacifica became, Pacifica Radio became and still is the the only serious independent broadcasting network in the United States. It's been enormously important and was hugely important in what happened there in the 1960s. Um, and then there was the mine troupe here in the uh, city parks. Um, they were in the milieu um, that had affiliations with Ken Kesey down the peninsula uh, in Palo Alto. Ken Kesey, uh, to make money, um, subjected himself to LSD experiments at the VA hospital in Palo Alto, liked what he tasted. And I think the real conditions of possibility for what happened, be beyond, the, beyond the question of a kind of bohemian ferment and antinomian sense and spirit, 
of the Bay Area, which was founded, remember, not like a lot of Western settlements by overland Puritans in wagon trains, Christians and one to another, but in fact by black sheep, chancers, and ne'er-do-wells who'd come round Cape Horn um, to try to make a fortune in the gold fields. So San Francisco feistiness um, has a, a very, very deep history into the 19th century for sure. Um, but I want to say that what was important, I think we have come to conclude in the West of Eden, was its key to what happened there was the proximity, the propinquity of two great commons in the East Bay, the campus of a very large public university, and in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Park and its panhandle. Um, site of a successful struggle in the beginning of the 1960s by Ron Davis, the Brechtian Meister of the Mine Troop, um, the successful legal struggle to stage political theatre in the open air. And, of course, the open air is a, another key factor, I would say. History get, basically gets made in the open air. I mean, what happens in the boardrooms and so on is important, but I would say big age history begins in the open air. And it's very important to think of what happened um, in the Bay Area counterculture as importantly happening in the open air. And, of course, that's also partly an environmental question and what you know, what you can do in the open air. As far as personal responses to the communes, what it felt like to experience this in California, in America, in that moment, and this must be must have its correlates in in British communes, rural communes, um, a kind of black and decker world of DIY and so on. Um, it's well expressed in the book by Jesse Drew, who later went to work for Dolby, a very brilliant engineer working for Dolby Studios in San Francisco, um, and a pioneer of the independent media scene. He tells the story of his journey to and life at Black Bear Commune, the, the one where the Panthers went rifle practicing, up near the Oregon border. Uh, Jesse describes the continental network of communes, and I'm speaking here now beyond the Bay Area, it was, a, it was a network of crossing the, the continent through which he passed en route to Black Bear. He was on, run, on the run uh, from a, um, an uncongenial home in Boston uh, in the mid-60s. Um, he talks about it in terms of autonomous or outlaw zones and remembers that quote, and I'm quoting Jesse here, Far from evoking a feeling of isolation and desolation, they encouraged a great feeling of liberation and self-reliance for many of us. It was the clearest example that the new vision many of us had for a new way of living actually worked. The remoteness of our existence created the perfect laboratory environment to explore and develop alternatives to an oppressive and shallow status quo, from social governance to technology to food production. It's interesting. And I just want to focus in now on technology of a certain certain suite of technologies of intermediate appropriate. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about um, building and eating for a moment. As I said before, in comparison to the great blueprints of 19th century New World Utopian communities, um, charted in, some of you will know, Hayden's classic uh, Seven American Utopias, I commend it to you if you haven't seen it. Uh, the communes of the 60s and 70s were for the most part improvised, as I said, ad hoc affairs. Almost all communal housing was adapted from existing structures and uh, refunctioned collective projects. Where there was new building, it was disgraceful. We can have to say that. I, you know, some of you on your shelves have you know, architecture without architects, and I see to nobody in my admiration for self-build. I've done some of it myself. Um, 
the hippie architecture is, of course, rightly a byword for the forged uh, and the half-built. Um, the forge, as even if they hoped it would rescue it, um, the forge cannot be rescued by an orbital sander round every corner. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> of course, the iconic utopian form associated with the Russian counterculture is but Mr. Fuller's geodesic dome. The Cold War modernist object, which has not weathered well, it leaks in 64 places. but did express commitment to a new world, albeit in tension with a nostalgia for the traditional and the indigenous. Um, and in a way, you have the, the classic uh, cedar shingle clad in a kind of utopian uh, geodesic thing behind there, behind the little shed. Um, yeah, the half-built and the botched. I mean, something could be said for uh, adapting, I mean, of course, Bucky himself was keen to use modernist materials, um, the, the plastics, the <laughs> byproducts of hydrocarbon civilization. But, uh, and there is something to be said for using um, the, uh, the leftovers from uh, studs and you know two by fours, which is what a lot of them did. And incidentally, that was true of commoning in in this country. So if you go to some of the back streets of the old royal um, shipyards, if you go to Chatham in Kent, for example, you'll find that because under the old commoning regime, where um, you were entitled to the waste. Of your, of your trade, um, the shipwrights could carry out under their arm as much as they could carry at the end of the day, as long as it was three foot or under, right? So a lot of the old houses, the old, very old houses, chap, and you'll find, are built off three foot and less pieces of timber. And this, of course, could be usefully done in terms of a, a duties of dome. I mean, this, this is the utopian form, the built form of the counterculture. And it's, it's not where it were, let's say, let's say so. Um, sorry. Um, those domes, of course, were for the most part done either in the exurbs or in deep in the countryside in rural California. In the city, the refunctioning often took the form of abandoned factories. Here is the most famous of the urban artists' communes in North America. This is the, the famous Project Arto, A-R-T-A-U-D, as in Arto, um, squatted um, by theater types and uh, artisans in the late 60s. It took 20 years to get regularized with the city. The city was faced, of course, with a tremendous number of buildings uh, that were lying empty. This, of course, is standard for cities uh, everywhere where uh, capital and manufacturing wanders off according to its own logic and leaves these places empty. And the city has a problem. And it went into negotiation. It took 20 years to regularize it. Because, of course, it's wildly out of code. And one of the stories of West of Eden um, is what we came to call the Code Wars. Um, the artists and communards in Project Arto and hundreds of others found themselves from the outset in fights with government 
and state bureaucracies over violation of the building regulations. In fact, a, a building inspector could go into Project Arto and in fact into any any building more or less, because of code creep regulations change it every year, and and find, you know, M, you know, 10, 20, 100, 200 code violations. And anybody who runs a club uh, or a pub or anything in any city, um, um, I mean, this is urban corruption 101, anybody who, do, who does this knows that you're only open because they haven't closed you down. The fire marshal uh, su supervenes everything else, and that's happened over and over again. Um, it happened over and over again, both in the city and the country. When, when the state or a neighborhood comes after you, they'll close you down. They'll do it through the codes. Eventually, the city willed the shoehorning uh, of this building, uh, an old canning factory, it turns out. Um, they wanted it to work, and eventually, but it took 20 years. And the sword of Damocles was hanging over these artisans for 20 years. People came from all over the world to try to understand how they had managed this, how had they done the negotiation, what kind of leases had they managed, given health and safety and so forth. Um, okay, I'm drawing to a close here. Um, Just a word about legacies, and we've talked about foodways and civic life and so on. One of the interesting uh, annual rituals in the Bay Area that's hinterland uh, is, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow in, in the seminar anyway, um, is a, a city. Um, in the Nevada desert, on the old Pleistocene lake bed, Lake Lahontan. It's a place, beautiful flat playa. And there's a city there um, without motor cars. It's a kind of, in that sense, a city devoted to appropriate technology. It takes motor cars to get there, but for uh, uh, one week every year, it's a kind of countercultural Eden. Has anyone here been to Burning Man? This is a this is an interesting space. It's extremely hostile. There's no wall. So it's a place to see the desert. It's a lake bed. The world land speed record is held there. It used to be a, used to do that in Utah, but now they do it here. Um, it's um, no money changes hands. It's a decommodified. It's not quite true. But I mean, there's two things you can buy there, but only two things: coffee uh, and ice. Uh, what is interesting about it is is that, in that sense, it's clearly a direct legacy um, of the Bay Area counterculture. It's it's absolutely continuous with the, the spirit of the of the sixties. And the second thing to say about it is that they love Burning Man um, more than anybody. They love it at Google headquarters. If you go into Google headquarters, which in a way is the kind of iconic 21st century workspace of the leading edge, if you go into the vestibule of the of Google, what you'll find is a series of photographs uh, of Burning Man. They like, in other words, what we're talking about here is a kind of a cultural appropriation along rather analogous to big, uh, big groceries taking up the the, the food ways of the co-op, um, they really like, they really like geodesic domes and um, decommodified labor. 
it's free. It's free. You actually have to pay a ticket costs you, but that's you do that online in a few months in advance. After that, it's free. Um, So this is a, a complex and contradictory picture, I think I'm trying to paint here, of the 60s. Um, the culture of Silicon Valley, as I say, draws very deeply from the communal wells of the Bay Area counterculture. Refracted, above all, through the utopian globalism, um, no, that, that form, that's the, that, by the way, that is the shape um, of Black Rock City, of Burning Man. That's a view from above of the city. Um, it's a sacred, most of the circle. See? <laughs> Things haven't changed that much. Utopia. It's a couple of people I came across at Burning Man. So drawing deeply from the wells of the Bay Area counterculture, reflected through the, the Whole Earth catalog. Bible of the rusticating hippies and back to the landers, who imagined an alternative green world, powered by appropriate techniques available for purchase by mail order. So this is, a, in a way, the contradiction, important contradiction at the heart of our researches, trying to understand the, the kind of the, the, the primitivist ethos um, of the rusticating hippies. Um, central to that was the, if there was one thing they had on their shelves, it was the whole earth capital. And yet, what is this image? It's the earthscape as seen uh, from inner space, funded, of course, by, by the US military, whose project was, of course, the, domin the military domination of the Near Earth. Um, and it raises another, a second fundamental question that we haven't really answered yet which is the unlikely trajectory um, of the computer itself, which at the moment in which our research begins, in 1964, say, with the free speech movement, um, the computer represents everything that's dehumanizing. It's, it's, it's megatechnics, it's alienating, it's dehumanizing, it's IBM. Within a generation, it's transvalued to become a liberation technology. It's small, it's nimble, it's, it's Mac. So from soul murder to convivial tool, all within 20 years. Well, I won't say more. Uh, just to let you know, that's the kind of thing we're going to if the motor car is if, if if the motor car is stopped, then we get an incredible explosion of tricycles, quadricycles, polycycles, just like they did in the eighteen nineties before the motor car arrived. The decade of the the bicycle. This is great stuff. And a reinvention of gleaning. And I just finish with an image um, that's going to be on the front of the book. This is West of Eden. And you can see that that is um, that's the famous woodcut from 1516. And it didn't take much of a um, like photoshopping by Mona Caron, a little artist. That, in fact, is the view from my window in Berkeley, by the way. Um, and there's the Golden Gate at the top. And, and 
in the Twin Peaks on the left, and the sacred Omphalos of the Bay Area, Mount Tam on the right. That's actually unchanged on the right there. It's pretty remarkable. And of course, that makes Alcatraz a utopia in the middle of the bay. Um, it's kind of interesting. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much.